I, I, I am shaking a little bit too. Somebody already made that joke, and uh, a sodium of one hundred two with a chloride of fifty seven uh, is strikingly low. Um, I don't know. I mean, the the BUN and creatinine are also elevated as well, uh, but the fact that the potassium and bicarbonate are normal, don't know what to make of that. Um, don't know if that's you know. If it's okay, I'm going to give you a tip when you have something crazy like this. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and list all the abnormalities. All right. Don't so. You're, you're not ready to just look at this and, and the answer pops into your brain. So maybe one day you will, but in the meantime, let's, let's, let's make a list of the abnormalities. And you started to say it. So what, what's the first abnormality you see? Hyponatremia. Right. And, that, and ha how serious is that hyponatremia? Severe. I mean, unless what? Um, I guess unless they've been living there for a long time. No, there's something missing here. Um, the, oh, the glucose. Right. Unless it's a really high glucose. So, and 102 could cause a seizure. So in the back of our minds, until we know what the glucose is, we're worried that this is a hyponatremic seizure in a guy with no past medical history. Okay, what's the next thing you see that's abnormal? Hypochloremia. Okay, so that's true. The chloride has to be low if the sodium's low, right? Mm -hmm. What's the anion gap? It is 19. Right, so, that, so it is an elevated anion gap unless the albumin is six. Does, there, does everybody get that? If anybody doesn't get that, please put it in the chat and I'll explain it. Um, okay, good. Somebody doesn't get it. So albumin is the major part of the anion gap. And there's a complex... <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the normal anion gap is 11 minus, don't write this down, 11 minus 2.5 times the difference in the albumin from four. That, that's just too hard to remember. So what, what we always do is just multiply the albumin times three and it's pretty darn close. So unless we have a really high albumin, uh, there's there's an increased anion gap. If let, let's assume for right now that the anion gap, uh, that the normal anion gap for this patient is 12 and it's 19. So we're going to let Norma, because because Josh is over there sweating, and and uh, I need to let Norma do some sweating also. So how does that help us if the anion gap is 19? So first of all, we have to think about anion gap acidosis, but what else does that tell us? Yeah, probably an excess of anions. That okay, are yes, the so no, there's an excess of anions. So there's some unmeasured anion, but the other thing it tells us is, is that the patient anion? probably also has a metabolic alkalosis, right? How the hell did he get there? What is this guy doing? Is it because um, the bicarbonate's high? The bicarbonate's normal, but the if you didn't have an anion gap, so if you do a delta gap, the delta gap is the difference between the gap we observe and the gap that we expect. We expect 12, we get 19. So the delta gap here is seven. What do we do with the seven? We assume we got rid of the anion gap and it was really all bicarbonate. And so th if that were true, what would the bicarbonate be? 33, right? Right. So the patient probably has a uh, metabolic alkalosis. 
Now, Gerlein uses the delta delta ratio, which I've never understood. So Gerlein, I'm gonna let you get on and tell us why you did that, what it means. And uh, I've never been able to figure out the delta delta. I'm not sure if I understand it any better, but I was, I remember when we first learned it, you just do the anion gap that is normal, which is 12, and you subtract that from the anion gap you have. So I just did a minus 12, and then I divided by the 24 is the normal bicarb minus the 20, 26 minus the 24, and I got two. So then I got 3.5. So usually if it's greater than two, it's a com combination of the metabolic acidosis and the metabolic glosis because your ratio, it means that you have your anion gap difference is greater than your difference in bicarb. So that means that your bicarb is actually closer to the 24 than it should be. So that means that there's a concomitant disorder besides the anion gap metabolic acidosis. I'm still confused. <laughs> But uh, no, I know people uh, use that. Yeah, and Joel uh, I do it the other cool. way. Uh, Joel Toft does it the same way I do it. So uh, that, that was a good test for me. So we'll have to see what, is al what the albumin is. So normal, what else do you see abnormal here? Um, so we have an elevated BUN and elevated creatinine here as well. Right. And since we don't know anything about this guy, we don't know if this is acute or chronic. Mm -hmm. And it's about two to one. So this is a really strange BMP. It's a really strange BMP. So we need more information, right? Yes, that would be great. Because even at 102, even at 102, we can't be sure the patient is truly hyponatremic. This still could be pseudo hyponatremia. And to be truly hyponatremic, you have to have decreased serum osms. So we could either get them to give us the glucose, understanding that all the formulas don't really work that well for adjusting the sodium for glucose, or we can actually measure serum osms. So which one do you have for us, Sean? I'll uh, give you the glucose, and I'll say it, that it was reported by the lab as greater than 4,000. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've never seen that. I think the highest I've seen, I've seen some in the uh, 2000 range. What did his blood look like? That's just what I'm thinking about. Um, sugar cane. Yes, yeah, like syrup? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, th this is a case I found uh, online. Um, so we could, we can play around with the formulas, but I promise you the formulas don't work once you get a sugar this high. And, uh, so the best thing to do is go ahead and check a serum osm. But this changes everything. This changes everything. So what, if the sugar really got to 4,000, what would you be thinking? Well, I was thinking um, possibly hyperglycemic, hypovolemic syndrome, where it, which, which I would typically see in, in, in an elderly patient. And I'm and I was just wondering, based on his BUN and creatinine, maybe he's just not drinking. So so uh, this could be HHS, absolutely. Um, and it would suggest that, that he that he has uh, has had diabetes, but he has an increased anion gap. So could this be type one with diabetic ketoacidosis? I would I would think it's less likely to be type one, and maybe you know maybe that what is it type three C the if he does have some degree of exocrine pancreatic dysfunction or endocrine. Okay, so let's make sure everybody understands your, your thought process here. 
what is the usual sodium in people's diabetic ketoacidosis? Usually, I think like one, uh, 120 to 115. N no, no. For, for the glucose. What's the usual glucose in oh. diabetic ketoacidosis? Oh, I'm sorry, I was talking about the sodium. Um, yeah, usually 400, 500. Right, somewhere in that range, four, five, six, maybe 700. But anything more than that is probably not type one and probably not diabetic ketoacidosis. But yet the patient has an increased anion gap. So we have to think about what could be causing the anion gap, and then we'll have to get back and try to figure out what the heck's going on with the sugar. We don't believe that number. Why don't we believe that number? Because we've never seen that number. That seems crazy. Well, so, so Tra Travis is saying that you have to have the bicarb below 18 for DKA, but if you had enough metabolic alkalosis, it's possible that you could have a fairly normal bicarb, but I'm really stretching that. Just stick into the, just stick into the textbook, but a hundred percent. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I don't really always believe the textbook because I don't, I, I don't like authority just in general. I don't like authority. Okay. So what are the possibilities for that for the his increased anion gap? Do we have an albumin? Uh, his albumin is three point seven. Okay, so he should have an anion gap of about eleven. He has an anion gap of nineteen. So what what's causing that? Well, most of you know that I love kill you, right? So let's let's go through kill you and and, and think about what might possibly be causing the anion gap other than diabetic ketoacidosis. So Josh, you're thinking about ketones as a source of the anions from, so Kushal says starvation or alcohol. Okay, that's a possibility. What else is, a, so that's the K in kill you. Um, can you think of an ingestion that would give you these numbers? other than a bottle of maple syrup. I can't, I, I'm i having a hard time coming up with an ingestion. <laughs> Mountain Dew, <laughs> not, not nice thinking, Drew. Could this be a lactic acidosis? So Josh, can, can you make a case for a lactic acidosis? Not with a glucose that high, but I'm maybe you could say that if he's just his his blood is so hyperviscous that there's a lot of hypoperfusion going on. But I don't okay. know. Okay. Norma, can you can you make a case for a lactic acidosis? Um it could be if um if the, we have a patient that's presenting with um concomitant alcohol usage. But that would usually be alcoholic ketoacidosis. So actually I can make a case. So now you have to figure out how I'm gonna make a case that this could be a lactic acidosis. No. There's something no. about this case that, that makes me think- Oh, that... the seizures. Right, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. So. If he really did have a seizure, that's a cause of a transient lactic acidosis. So what's what's the next thing you're gonna do for this guy? Is he still seizing? Hopefully not. So you're really close to the exactly correct answer. You're gonna go examine him. You're gonna see, is he awake? You're gonna see what's going on. Did he really have a seizure? Try to get a history of this. See if he was incontinent, see if he heard anything. See who said he had a seizure. We just, we just need more story. In the meantime, we don't believe, we don't believe this uh, BMP. 
So what's the first thing you do if you don't believe the BMP? Redo it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you, you know, you might want to get a VBG with it, but uh, that's the fastest way for it. We can get a point of care electrolyte panel really quickly uh, from, from either uh, a venous or an arterial blood gas. So what happens when we examine the patient? So <clears throat> when you came to examine him, um, he could not answer any of your questions, but he could withdraw from pain. Uh, he was able to withdraw in all extremities, so he didn't really have any focal deficits. He couldn't give you any history. Uh, there was no friends or family. He was just dropped off by an ambulance. That sounds like my internship. <laughs> my entire internship. There was never anybody could tell me anything. Okay. And what about, and so, and so the exam really doesn't help us very much. He doesn't have any medicines in his pockets. Uh, there's a debate going on of whether we're going to give him lactated ringers or whether we're going to give him saline. So, so um, his temperature is fine. And he had a heart rate of like 90s, blood pressure was 110s over 80s. So really unremarkable vital signs. So, so the chat is going crazy about normal saline rather than lactated ringers. And why, why is the chat going crazy about that? Because I love LR, but there's only a few scenarios where I like to give NS and like you taught me, a um, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis is one of them. And this guy's chloride is really low. Yeah, no, but it's low because the sodium is low. So we're going to have to figure all that out. I really want a serum osm. I want to repeat the BMP. I want the serum osm to see, see if he's actually hyponatremic. We're going to get a lactate because we're concerned that, that he really did have a seizure and we're going to get ketones. In the meantime, do you want to give him some insulin? I would like to recheck his sugar. The point of care on him. Okay, so Norma asks the exact right question. Is it possible the bicarb is falsely normal because the chloride is so low? Um, that's a really hard question to answer. So the, the chloride is low partly because the sodium is low, but partly because the uh, patient also has uh, a slight metabolic alkalosis. And that's why that, I think that's why the bicarb the bicarb should be much higher. So my guess is the patient got volume contracted first. This is not where we give Creon, Travis. <laughs> okay, so can, can we get a lactate and a repeat BMP? And um, I, I think you could either give saline or you could give uh, lactated ringers. You need, I just think you need to give him volume because my guess is that uh, with with uh, the only thing that surprised me is that his heart rate's 70, but his blood, his blood pressure's down. His numbers look like he's volume contracted. Uh, make sure he's making urine, but I think he, I think uh, he need he needs, he needs fluids. He needs a little insulin. We need to order a phosphate. Somebody said that earlier and we need to think about uh, thiamine Okay. I, I mentioned this on rounds today. I want everybody to, to memorize this. Every time you're going to treat high, high glucose or feed a cachectic person, ask yourself, is the thiamine okay? Is the phosphate okay? Over and over and over again. Because that's the only way we're going to hurt the patient with glucose or with insulin. Not the only way, but that's, the, that's a major way. So what, what do you have for us, Sean? 
Um, I can give you the serum osm first, and okay. that was 350. Um, a repeat BMP comes back basically the same. Um, and then you want the lactic next, or would you like your BBG? Uh, let's get the lactate. Uh, his lactate is 9.2. And no normal is? Less than 2.2. .2. Okay. So, back to Josh. Now, now what do you think? I think that there's a uh, real hyponatremia going on here. Or so, at least part, so, at least part of now. So I don't, okay. I don't know if I necessarily expect the serum osm to be 350 and then the sodium to still be 102. But I, I guess I should step back and wait till we see what the repeat shows. Um, but the the lactic acidosis um, might might confirm the acidosis part, but I think we still I still need an explanation for why the serum osm is 350 with that repeat glucose. Okay, so let, let's define hyponatremia and hypernatremia. And this is always really really confusing for for medical students and interns and many many residents. It, it's it's not the it's not the sodium. It's the osms, because all we're really saying when someone's hyponatremic is their osms are down. I know that sounds funny when, when you first hear it and start thinking about it. Uh, Anne Marie says if the glucose was actually four thousand, that would contribute. To uh, 222 osms. That is if the, if the calculations were correct and the calculations are not correct. So when you see crazy numbers like this, just check the serum osms and believe the serum osms. So he's hyperosmolar, which means by definition, he's dehydrated. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So not only do we need to give him, flu so we need to give him volume if we think he's volume down but we also are gonna to need to give him water. And, but, we, but we don't wanna give him glucose. So it's gonna be a while before we can get that, before we can get his osms down. Perhaps uh, we can, uh, as, as we're treating his hyperglycemia, thing, things will start, start to correct. We'll look at, let's look at the repeat BMP and see how close it is. So yeah, the repeat is about the same. I think the sodium was maybe 103 and potassium was like 3.8, but it was largely the same. And was the glucose the same? It uh, was slightly lower on repeat and it was one second. It was about 2,000. About 2,000. And, and, and I can believe 2,000 because I've seen 2,000. We had a patient up in Huntsville a number of years ago who kept on coming in with, with a glucose of 2,000 over and over and over again. Um, and 2,000 actually fits his osms, the, the estimation of the osms. Um, much better. Uh, you, you'll find that the calculations are, are really just estimates um, and, and they don't always work. Okay, so we're gonna give him fluids. We're gonna try to lower his glucose. Did we get a phosphate and a thiamine on him by any chance? I can tell you the thiamine in about three or four days, um, but the phos was about six. Okay, so we should be okay at least for 24 hours giving him insulin. Is he going to need very much insulin? So Drew says we can't give him insulin yet. Why can't we give him insulin yet, Drew? Because his osms are too high. Yeah, the, the. I think you could do both at once. The, 
Yeah. So in treating, um, in my experience, when treating a patient with HHS, the very first step that you do before you, before you even think about giving someone insulin, if they have HHS, is you give them volume first and basically try to dilute them down so that, and only when the glucose stops dropping, as in the plateaus to, I don't know, about 200 to 300 or so, then you start giving insulin. It's a, it, 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 essentially, it's a fix the volume contraction issue first, then fix the glucose issue. So since I don't do ICU medicine anymore, I, I'm not going to argue with anybody. Uh, I would, I would be running in fluids quite rapidly, but I would be touching him with small doses of insulin to bring the sugar down because if I don't bring the sugar down, then whatever I, whatever goes into his vein is going to go right out in his urine. He has, he has an obligatory uh, osmotic uh, diuresis. Mm. And so if I, so I ha at, at 2000, I've got to lower it some, I don't want to go crazy. Um, and I do want to give him a lot of fluids. Uh, assuming that he can handle the fluids. We, we, we have a thiamine pending. We're going to give him thiamine. We're just, we're just going to give him thiamine. How much thiamine are we going to give him? So, 400 TID or 500 TID. Yeah, that, 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 is, uh, that seems to be the standard uh, in 2020 for the first couple of days, that, that should keep us from, from uh, developing Wernicke's. It could be as, that he has lactic acidosis because he's thiamine deficient. That's another possibility. because we don't know if he had a seizure. We can understand that he has altered mental status because he's in a hyperosmolar state. Uh, so his BMI was 36, his weight was 90. So where are we going from here, Sean? Well, um, we can give you kind of what happened after he got some fluids and some insulin. Um, his sodium actually basically self-corrected fairly quickly. Um, Are we worried about his sodium self-correcting? So normally at 102, we're very, we're very scared if the sodium goes up too fast. But here he's not really hyponatremic. The, the 102 is just a number. He's not really hyponatremic because he's hyperosmolar. And so the, the risk, his sodium correcting really is telling us that his glucose is coming down. I assume those two things happened at, at the same time. Is that, is that correct, Sean? Yeah, yeah. It was actually pretty interesting that basically every time his sodium went up, his glucose went down. Okay, continue. And so once he got at a glucose of about 250, his sodium was 134. Um, his mental status improved. He was able to start taking in PO. Um, and this was really the first time he had had medical contact. Um, did not have any past medical history that he knew about. Hadn't really seen a doctor though before. And what IV fluids did they give him? Uh, so he was getting uh, normal saline. Okay. And did they give him potassium? So there was a concern here that, that once you give insulin, you drive potassium into cells. So uh, basically, as we trended his labs, once his serum potassium got below about 3.3, we started adding in uh, potassium into the fluids, about 40 milliequivalents, and that kept him repleted. He never really got below 3.2. Okay, I wanna make sure that our learners know 
how fast they can give potassium and uh, so they can pick the right dose. So if you gave 40, so you, you're giving 40 millicolons, how are you giving that? Are you getting, giving it orally or IV? So it was mixed into each liter of fluid. Okay. So how fast can we run those fluids? So Josh, do you have any, do you have any idea about how fast we can run potassium into a vein? Yeah, for a peripheral vein, you can do 10 an hour. For a central vein, you can do 20 an hour. You have, I think you have to have two large bore uh, veins and be on in an ICU with monitor to give more than 10 milliequivalents. You usually don't want to give even 10 milliequivalents though per hour. Why is that? I suspect risk for hyperkalemia. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. Norman, do you know why? This is not physiology, by the way. Well, um, I just knew that you shouldn't do it too fast or because it'll hurt. That's yes. Potassium is usually what they give like people on death row. <laughs> yes. So, so it actually, it, it can ruin the vessels actually. It, it burns the vessels. So unless you have a really, really large uh, IV in, I, I usually try to stay at five milliequivalents per hour for the IV um if you go too high you can actually get cardiac uh problems and how fast you get so if sean tells us that they're putting in 40 mil equivalents into the bag how fast are they running the bag now this seems like i'm getting really picky yoon but for the learners out there who sooner or later are going to have to write uh iv orders you got you got to be able to do these kinds of calculations. Yeah. So, you, so if there's forty milli equivalents in a bag. You wouldn't want to run it five an hour. So you you prefer max of five an hour or max of ten an hour? I, I prefer shooting for five an hour unless the patient has has uh, EKG findings of hypokalemia. Yeah, so you'd have to, and then the patient needs to be in the CCU. Yeah, that that max out at 125. Right. So so one so if he puts if you put 40 mil equivalents in, and you want to run it at five per hour, 125, you can go a little bit faster than that if you really thought you needed the fluids. So the the question and and this the, this to me is the best example of wanting you guys to understand how to give potassium rather than telling you how to give potassium. So if, if you're shooting for five, but you need to run 250 per hour into this guy. Norm, Norma, I'm, I know I'm playing math games, but. Uh... I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not quite following. Okay, good. <laughs> So that, I love that answer that you're not following. That means that I'm not explaining it well. So this is, this is my, this is, I'm doing a bad job if you don't understand it. Okay, we're running in IV fluids. We got a one liter bag most of the time. So the IV fluids, normal saline for right now, and we're gonna add potassium to the bag. That doesn't take up a lot of volume. So we assume that it magically just goes in there. So the first calculation we did is if we have 40 mil equivalents in the bag and we want five to come out every hour, then, then we divide five into 40 and we get eight. We divide eight into a liter and we get 125. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So now, if we thought that we needed to give him a higher volume of fluid and we wanted him to get 250 cc's per hour, how much potassium would you put in the bag? 
This is an algebra question, but it's an algebra question you need to be able to answer uh, when, when you're writing orders. Okay, here's another way to think about it. If, if you want him to get five an hour and you're running it at, at 250 cc's per hour, how long is it gonna take you to run in a liter to, at 250 cc's per hour? It take four hours. Right, so multiply four times five and you're gonna put 20 in the bag. Oh, okay. Does, it, does that make sense? It does, so you would just put less potassium in right. the bag. Okay, so you, okay, right. I get you. Okay, I'm sorry, I was trying to do the math and I'm just not very fast. No, no that's okay, That's a, and, and, and that's why I'm going over this because what happens too often when you're an intern is you put you put some potassium in a bag because you've done somebody told you to do that once before, and then some attending comes by and says, change that 20 millicoulons to 40 millicoulons, and they don't explain to you why. Well, that doesn't help you. And so understanding the principle behind how fast you're gonna how fast you're gonna give the fluids uh, would change everything. So the, the now now there's a big debate going on uh, about how to give fluid and free water deficits because this guy has a huge free water deficit, right? Yeah. Every, everybody will agree with that, right? He has a he has a serum of three hundred and fifty. That means he has a free water deficit. That's by definition he's dehydrated. He's volume contracted and he's dehydrated. Do we need to give him? Do we need to give him water to, to fix that? And the, the, so the question is, do we think his kidneys are working? And we're gonna have to look and see what kind of urine he's making. And uh, I'd love to have a urinalysis. Do we happen to have, happen to have a urinalysis? Yeah, um, so his UA, uh, was negative for ketones, had one plus protein, three plus glucose, and then his spec grab on it was uh, 1020. I don't believe that spec grab. Why don't I believe it? And, and as much as I love the specific gravity, I can't use it. Because he's got glucose in his urine, and that and that changes the specific gravity, right? I don't know what to do with three plus protein. We're gonna we'll work up the three plus protein uh, once once we uh, one, once we get his glucose under control. So I'll, I'd repeat that urinalysis and then get a urine protein creatinine ratio. So I think that he's going to be able to. Um, hold on to free water. So when his sodium was 134 and his glucose was uh, 150, you said? So that means he, he fixed himself. And, and, and was, this, was this all done with normal saline? Yep, yeah, he uh, basically got normal saline and then and, a and what happened of insulin. To, what happened to his BUN and creatinine? Um, so his BUN went down to about 18 and his creatinine went to 0.9. So this is a rate lim this was a rate limiting step. We had to assume that his kidneys would work. The fact that he was making urine all along is, is good. And just and a, a lot of times if you have normal renal function, the kidneys will just figure out how to hold on to the water once you once you give it enough fluid, the kidneys will just fix it, uh, and and they don't the kidneys don't do calculations; they just fix it. So, Sean, what are what are the main things that we should have gotten out of this discussion? I hope we did. So, I, I think one of the main things was definitely, and this is why we left the glucose off from the beginning to not get super freaked out about that one hundred two. I was actually kind of curious if 
we would say, let's give them 3% for that um, hyponatremia. But I think what this is a good uh, illustration of is that this is like a pseudo hyponatremia and you can just manage it with fluids and insulin. Yeah, so now the, the good thing is when we get BMPs, we always get a glucose with it. When else might we see uh, pseudo, pseudo hyponatremia? In a hyperprotein state. Right. So uh, now this depends upon the, the um, machine that they're using and, and whether they're doing uh, serum or plasma because um, the modern machines, so hyperproteinemia can do it uh, and high, tri high triglycerides can do it. But they don't. We don't tend to have that. At least the hospitals that 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 we work on in Birmingham, they've already corrected for that. So we don't we don't see pseudo hyponatremia except for with hyperglycemia anymore. Um, uh, so it's a great question from Sherry. Uh, did uh, did did it mention whether the lactic acid uh, got better once we gave fluids? Yeah, so it, that lactic acid cleared pretty quick. I think he got three liters of fluid um, in between his recheck, and it was like 2.1 on recheck. Yeah, so, and that could just be from the volume contraction because uh, you think it was a type B lactic acidosis. Okay, Travis, make, make your case for that. Um, I mean, I, I think you probably could make a case that it could be a type A if he's just hypoperfused. Um, um, you know, just low volume, but um, I guess if it's a type B lactic acidosis, it could be, you know, something to do with, um, you know, we talked about like keto, uh, alcoholic ketoacidosis, which I don't think he had, um, but likely it could be a starvation ketosis as well. I mean, if he's like an uncontrolled type two diabetic, you know, his right. glucose level is so high and, you know, his body's uh, you know, having to break down fat through glycolysis for energy, uh, that lactic acid could be high from that. Okay, so his ketones were negative, so he probably did not have ketosis. I think this is probably type A, uh, type A lactic acidosis. So let's, let's go over that terminology for everybody. Type A is uh, dying, uh, dying tissue. And even though his blood pressure is uh, 110 over 70 or over 80, he probably is being underperfused. So uh, type A we normally see with shock, we see with dying limbs. So, so uh, a, a limb that's dying, gut, gut that's dying, that's all type A. Type B is medications and produced by uh, tumors, usually liquid tumors. Um, I think this is probably type A. Um, especially since it cleared so fast and he wasn't on any medications before. Thiamine deficiency, I guess, would be type B. So this, I guess it could have been thiamine deficiency. Did they mention giving him thiamine, Sean? Yeah, so he had gotten um, some thiamine as part of that initial uh, fluids. So there could have been a component of that yeah. for sure. But so, so I... So, it looks like they gave the fluids, the insulin, the potassium all at once. Is that correct? Yeah, basically. Yeah. So Drew wants us to just give fluids and then see what happens. I don't think I'd do, I, I couldn't do that at 2000, but then I admit I'm not an ICU doc, Drew. So I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to turn that over to the endocrinologists and the, and the ICU docs. How much fluids did he need to correct, Sean? I think he ended up getting about 15 liters. Yeah, I think one, one of the things with HHS is really they only need fluids. I mean, they need like a whiff of insulin, um, you know, to help. And, you know, the correction rate versus like DKA, you know, one unit per kilo per hour, HHS, it's half that. So, you know, they need tons of fluids up front and then you give them a little bit of insulin. And... Okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna close up here. So Josh, what are the two most important things that you want to remember from from this very bizarre case? 
the first one is to be careful when I see what at first glance appears like hyponatremia, uh, especially in the setting of really elevated glucose, is to go for that serum osm. That's the first one. Um, and the second one is um, to, to just also proceed through the um, BMP sort of uh, little uh, square by square to name each problem instead of trying to put it all together right off the bat. Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad you said that, Josh, because I think that's really valuable. Once you start listing all the problems, uh, you start to get a, the, the picture is much easier to understand for someone who doesn't play around with this stuff all the time and, and is sort of a, 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 a BMP nerd. Um, Norma, what are your big takeaways? I would have to agree with Josh regarding the the low sodium that that really did shock me and it and for some reason I always forget I mean I guess it's just because I don't have enough experience being a third year medical student but um, but I always I always tend to to not look at the glucose especially since it wasn't given and the first thing that I thought of would be like oh my gosh this this person is is severely hyponatremic and we have to treat that um, and to take into consideration the serum osms. Um, and to always look at that to make sure you have a, a clear idea of what the sodium is actually doing. Um, so that was definitely my biggest takeaway from this case. Great. Um, yeah. And uh, Sean, why don't you why don't you have the last word? I 100% agree with what everybody already mentioned, and definitely the serum osm is kind of the important thing in this one to make sure that hey, you're okay with giving fluids and you don't really have to worry about overcorrecting this hyponatremia. Oh, and, and Norma said also the phosphate, yeah. So it, what's interesting, even though the phosphate is elevated here, I would, have, I would check it the next day and make sure that uh, the phosphate is not low because it's possible that by, when we, even though we're giving a small amount of insulin, there's going to be a, a lot of metabolism going on between the insulin and the glucose. And so always check that again. The metabolic alkalosis normal was probably volume contraction. And my, I'm sure that, that, the, that all, all that stuff got better with, uh, with aggressive fluid management. And th there's a great comment in the chat about how hard it is to, to assess volume status. Um, you know, for those, those of you who are good at bedside ultrasound, a guy like this would be really interesting to do, to look and see how flat his inferior vena cava is. Um, somebody did mention weight. If you happen to know the patient's weight and periodically, uh, I work mostly at the VA and we'll have someone come in and we know what their weight is normally, and we know what their weight is when they first come in, and that can sometimes help you understand how far volume down or up they are. Uh, you know, we certainly have patients with heart failure who come in and are 20 pounds up, uh, and I've seen people who are 10 to 15 pounds down, and and that that can help you pretty quickly figure out what what you need to do in terms of uh, volume. So Norma asked a good question. Could we have given this patient LR? I think we could have given the patient LR or normal saline. I think either one would have worked fine uh, because, the kid, because his kidneys were working. And so we don't have to be perfect if the kidneys are working. We just have to give him stuff that would take care of it. Travis, you agree with all that? Or do you disagree? No, that made my night. So that's a good way to, to end. Yeah, 